All right. I want you to take your Bible and go to 1 Samuel chapter number 30. 1 Samuel chapter number 30. I want to read one verse to you. First Samuel. And by the way, Wednesday night, we would love to have you come out 6.30 for our Bible study. We are going to pick up this week uh, talking about the life of Jesus Christ. We're going to walk you through that time period of those 33, 34 years, roughly, uh, Jesus was on this earth. We're going to walk you through and tie in the Old Testament that we just uh, talked about. We're going to tie in with his life and some remarkable things happen around Jesus' life. We want you to understand it, and uh, we're going to teach through that. I don't know of any uh, thing better you can talk about at church than Jesus, right? Uh, so uh, that's pretty, pretty good stuff. I made a I made a commitment a long time ago to myself because uh, as a pastor, you're always wondering what to preach. You you know, people ask me, when do you prepare your sermons and when I'm, there's no set time. You're constantly preparing sermons. Okay. You're getting thoughts and you're developing that and you're getting out your phone and you're jotting down notes. You're, you know, running around looking for a pen before it leaves your mind. Right. And then you're trying to, to hone in on that. You constantly do that. But I'm, Sometimes, now, I've always got something that I can preach, okay? I'm 37 years old. I once knew what it was like not to go to church. There was a two-week period in my life, okay? I've been around church. I've heard all the stories. Um, I can pull something out of thin air. I can find something to talk about and preach about, okay? Uh, or you can just do like my old preacher said. He said, ain't nothing to preaching. You just read a verse and holler. Read a verse and holler, and that's all there is to it. And that's pretty much it, right? Um, but, um, you know, I can find something to preach, but I, I don't want to just preach. I want a message from God. So sometimes, sometimes, she, she's wound up this morning, isn't she? <laughs> she, uh, 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 you know, I, I can find something to preach. That's not a problem. But I made a, a deal with myself a long time ago that when I don't know what to preach, because I... I I don't ever want to go to the pulpit and preach not thinking that that's what God wants for this hour, for today. I pray over this church and i was like, Lord, you know who's going to be there Sunday. You know who's going to be there Wednesday. And I want you to give me the thoughts that they need. I don't want to preach what I want to preach. I want to preach what those people need. What do your people need to hear? That's what I pray over and over. So, but here's what I always dis decided. If I'm torn about it, and I have been torn uh, a lot in my life, okay? I've actually had two or three sermons prepared in the fold of my Bible, set right there while we're singing, not know which one to preach, and still wrestling with the Lord over it. I want it to be right, though. Um, but I made him a deal a long time ago. If I ever don't know, I'm just going to preach Jesus. If I ever don't know, and I'm not sure, I'm just going to preach salvation through Jesus Christ. Because there's no greater story. This morning, I want to read you one verse, and I want to talk to you this morning on the subject, encouraging yourself in the Lord. Encouraging yourself in the Lord. There's a, there's a verse that every time I read it, and if you'll read through the Bible, there's, there's verses that just jump out to you, and the way it's worded, you need to underline it in Scripture. Maybe you don't know what it means right then, but you need to, to underline it. I always point out there's a verse in the book of Ruth, as Ruth is gleaning in the fields, and Boaz is, is leaving uh, some gleanings there for her on purpose. And the Bible says that he left her handfuls of purpose. Handful, and and that, that, that phrase always captivated me. Underline stuff like that in your Bible. This morning is one of those phrases, and I just want to talk to you about that verse. The Bible says this, And David was greatly distressed, for the people spake of stoning him, because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and for his daughters. But David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. The Amalekite, uh, let's pray. Father, I pray that you'll touch our hearts this morning. I pray you'll give me the words to say. Thank you for calling me to preach at nine years old. Thank you for letting me preach one more time here before this church. Thank you for another opportunity to stand and preach. I know I don't have anything to give, but I know you have everything. And so I yield this message to you and I pray you'll speak through me. 
to your people and help us. In Jesus' name, amen. The Amalekites have invaded the region, and there's a town called Ziklag. David, his family is in Ziklag. He has 600 men with him. Their families are in Ziklag. If you read the entire story, the Amalekites come in and they take everybody hostage. They take uh, uh, Hinoam, David's wife, and they take uh, 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 his, his other wife. I can't remember her name right off the top of my head. But he has two wives. He, they take them, take all his kids, take everybody, come in and clean house and take everybody prisoner and just keep moving on. The Amalekites are kind of a, you know, raiding party and everybody's broken hearted. They're sons. And I mean, imagine if you lived in a village or a town or a city and an enemy come in and you come home from war and your, and your wife's gone, your children are gone. Uh, they're, they're broken hearted and David is their leader and they get so upset because their family's gone that they turn on David. And that's usually, uh, when, when things go awry, we turn on those closest to, to us, don't we? We kind of take it out and, 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 and you know, uh, we see that a lot in relationships. When things, you know, when, when finances get tight, what do we do? We turn on those that love us the most and, and husband and wife bickering and fussing and fighting and taking something that is separate from them, take it out on each other. And that's, that's uh, what happened here. They, get, they turn on David and the Bible says that David was greatly distressed. He had a heavy load on him because... The people are talking about stoning him, okay? And back in those days, if they th- uh, talked about stoning you, they would do it, okay? I mean, they, they, they didn't like, if you, if you read uh, in Samuel, uh, or I'm sorry, in, in uh, uh, Chronicles, Zedekiah, the priest, told them something they didn't like. They stoned him in the temple court, killed him, okay? I mean, they, they turned on David, and they blamed him for the Amalekites taking their family. The Bible says... The soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and for his daughters. He was greatly distressed. They talked about stoning him. He had a weight on his shoulders. He had a a weight, an insurmountable weight that he could not lift. You ever been there? You ever ever had something so on you, a weight, that you didn't know if you could survive it? You didn't know if you had the ability to actually get up the next day because of the weight. Or maybe it's that weight as soon as you open your eyes. Sometimes in life, we wake up in the morning, we open our eyes, and for a moment, everything's good. And then we remember the weight that we carry. We remember the worry. We remember the fear. We remember the stress. We remember that anxiety. We remember that heaviness. And then we are just... In a moment, sucker punched back to reality. We don't know if we can carry it. But there's a little phrase at the end of this verse that says this. In the middle of this, it says, but David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. But David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. I believe that one of the secrets to the Christian life, and I believe there are many secrets that as you get to know the Lord, as you get to know the Bible, you you can kind of hone in on that'll help you in your walk with God. And one of those is learning to encourage yourself in the Lord. Learning to encourage yourself in the Lord. I want you to understand, kind of by way of introduction, That at times in life, encouragement's hard to find, isn't it? At times, you look for it and you you, you long for it and you desire it and you're looking everywhere. God, give me something. Give me a shred of hope. Give me something to lift my heavy heart. Give me something to pick me up. 
And I know and I look around this room and I know that many of you in the last year, the last few months, the last few weeks, it's just been like blow after blow after blow to your, to your uh, gut. And, and you don't, you, you just feel like it's, it's, it's blow after blow and you don't have anything else to give. It, it, it feels like you're down on the mat, but, but, but life keeps hitting you and the enemy keeps hitting you and you don't know. And you're looking around for some kind of hope, but there's not anything there. That you can see to find hope in. You know, life does that to you, doesn't it? Life does it. You know one thing I've learned about people? People will hurt you. Do you know that? People will hurt you. Maybe they don't mean to. I don't think, they, I don't think a lot of times they do. You don't realize what they're doing. But people hurt you. Man will leave you and hurt you. Okay? They'll stab you in the back. They'll, they'll, they'll uh, 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 put a knife in your back and you never thought. The people that you never thought would do something to you will do those things in life. And it's going to be hard to find encouragement. Family. Family will forsake you sometimes, won't they? Family will walk out, forsake you. Spouses will walk away from you. I've learned this in my life. Money will evade you. Won't it? Sometimes you, you're looking for hope and you, 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 you feel like you're drowning in, in, in the debts and the obligations that you had. Maybe it was wise, maybe it was unwise and, and, and uh, some of the decisions you made. But regardless of it, you find yourself drowning. You find yourself looking for hope. You find yourself looking for anything that you can latch on to to say there's a little bit of hope. And sometimes it's hard to find. Sometimes your health will fade away from you. Sometimes your health will fade away. Not just in the old bodies, but in the young bodies. Sometimes the 35, 40 year old finds out they have cancer. Sometimes the spouse has to bury her husband long before she ever should. Sometimes it's hard to find encouragement. But David gives us a key here, a giant clue. See, he is in one of those valleys in his life. He's at one of those bottom places in his life. He's not on the mountaintop. This is not the day that he killed Goliath. This is not the day that he picked up his head after cutting it off. And, and the, all Israel shouts for joy over this young man that had a great victory on behalf of the Lord. It's not that day. It's not the day that he defeated the, Phil, uh, the Philistines. It's not the day that he was anointed by Samuel as the next king. It's not the day that he was crowned king. It's not the big giant day in his life. It's the low point. And you're going to have low points in life. You are going to have low points. You are going to have valleys. You are going to have bottoms in your life. They are coming, guys. You are going to have them. You are going to face health concerns. Somebody's going to hurt you. Somebody's going to do something you never thought they would. Somebody is going to disappoint you. You're going to look for an encouragement. You're going to run into a financial problem in your life. You're going to run into a health concern, a health problem. It is going to come. The difference is how you handle it. The difference is how you handle it. In this life, you will have problems. In this life, you will have trouble, Jesus said. But be of good cheer. He said, I have overcome the world. In this world, you're going to have those, those problems. But you know, you know what the difference in you and an unsafe person is? Some preachers teach that when you become a Christian, everything's just hunky-dory. Everything's just great. And you're going to start a business and <clears throat> you're going to make a million dollars. Why? Because you, you're a Christian now. You, 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 you named it and you claimed it right now. Yeah, yeah, you got it, man. Oh, yeah, I'm never going to have a health concern. If, uh, you know, it's just, I, I can just speak to it and it's going to go away. Hey, you know what I've learned? That ain't true. You know what the difference is in me and a lost person? I still got problems. They got problems. I can still get sick. They can still get sick. Okay, we, we still have issues, but you know what the problem is? Or you know what the difference is? I've got Jesus and they don't. The difference is, is what I've got on the inside. The difference is, is that when people look at me, they can say, hey, look at how he's hand. Hey, we all, hey, 
We all got issues. We all got trouble. But watch how they handle it. Watch how they handle it. I've seen some of the most godly people that I've ever seen in my life have some of the biggest obstacles that come up in their life. I've seen some of the most godly people be the sickest people that I've ever met. Ill. But I've seen those smiles on their faces. I've seen that godly, prayerful attitude come out of them. Because those testings and those trials and those tribulations, they come. But you know what you and I have got to learn to do? We've got to learn when those times come. When, when everybody wants to stone us. When, when things go bad. When the Amalekites come in. Hey, I've got to learn to encourage myself in the Lord. You know what I've learned in my life? I've learned that there's only one person that will never leave you and forsake you. Only one. That's it. And you've got to draw your encouragement. You've got to draw your strength from the God of heaven. You have got to draw your strength from Him. You have got to figure out a way to encourage yourself in the Lord, your God. Amen? Because sometimes you're going to look around at your family and your friends and you're not going to find the encouragement from them. You're looking in the wrong place. The encouragement comes from the Lord. Sometimes you're going to even look, as sad as we can say, you're going to look to your church to give you the encouragement. And that encouragement's not going to be there. You've got to look to the Lord. You have got to learn in your own life to look to the Lord and encourage yourself. Amen. One of the secrets to the Christian life is... Self-discipline. Self-discipline. And I've said this many times. You've got to learn to do the right thing no matter what. You've got to learn to make yourself do the right thing. You've got to learn to put one foot in front of the other. When you wake up and when it doesn't feel like you want to. When it doesn't feel like you should. When you feel like doing something different, you've got to do the right thing. You've got to do the right thing. You've got to put one foot in front of the other. And you've got to learn to discipline yourself. Most Christians have no self-discipline. That's why they can't read their Bible consistently. That's why you read your Bible and then you skip a week and then you read a chapter and then you, you miss a week and you go and you wonder why you have no faith. You have no faith because you have no Bible in you. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. A self-disciplined person gets up every day. When they're sick, they read their Bible. When they're happy, they read their Bible. When they're sad, they read their Bible. They've got self-discipline. They start their day with a routine and they get in the Word of God. Okay, there is no, there's no magic spell to make you a good Christian. It is a lot of stinking hard work. Amen. We just built a wall at our house. Did you know that? We, we built a wall. We had to build a retaining wall. Okay. I built the wall. I thought Mexico would pay for it, but I sent them the bill and they didn't. I built a wall. Little, little Trump joke, right? Okay. I did. I built a retaining wall. Derek helped me. Jimmy helped me. My dad helped me. Daniel helped me. Um, Andrea put one block on the wall. She helped. Okay. Those blocks are heavy. They're like 70 pounds a piece. That doesn't sound like much, right? Okay. It's, you know, doesn't sound like much. It, it, it's not when it's down here. Okay. But it's when it gets to here and those blocks get, and you're, you're trying to get, get them. You know what? You know what it takes to build that wall? Block. After block, after block, after block, after block, after block. And that first run, it's got to be level and you got to uh, level it this way, level it that way. And it's got to be, it's got to be, man, you got it. Oh, man. Block after block. You don't end up with a wall after the first block, do you? You got to put one foot in front of the other. Go get another block. Pallet after pallet. You know what it takes to be a good Christian? Day after day. Day after day. Day after day. You've got to learn to discipline yourself in the Word of God. You've got to learn to encourage yourself in the Word of God. Some of us are looking for encouragement in all the wrong places. We're looking to our friends. We're looking to our family. We're even looking to godly people to always encourage us. Let me tell you something. Godly people are not always going to be there to encourage you. They're not always going to know the words to say. They're not always going to say the right thing. You have got to learn to get alone with God and encourage yourself in the Lord. Do you know that? You got to learn. Everybody in here, you need to learn how to preach. You need to learn how to preach. 
And you need to preach yourself a sermon every day. When you're, you're feeling a little uh, <clears throat> rebellious, I don't know if I want to go to church today. I don't know if I want to pray today. I don't know if I want to read the Bible today. And you would never come out and say it. See, I, I never say I don't want to read the Bible. But there's times I don't want to read the Bible. You know what I'm talking about? I would never say it because that would sound bad. Lord, I don't want to be, read the Bible today. I, I'm not that blatant, right? But it's like, ah, I'll find something better to do. I'll just turn on the TV. I'll just do this. Nothing wrong with watching the TV. Nothing wrong with doing other things. But you've got to learn to discipline yourself. You've got to learn to do the right thing day after day, over and over. That's what we have got to learn as a generation. That's what this generation of the church has got to learn. You graduates and you, those of you who are in teenagers and, and uh, those of you who are in 10th, 11th grade, 8th grade, 9th grade, we'll be recognizing you up here on stage before long. Right now, you've got to learn to put one foot in front of the other, to put block after block after block after block because you're trying to build your life into a life that honors God and it doesn't happen by accident. It happens on purpose and there's going to be times that you're going to be discouraged discouraged and you got to encourage yourself in the lord because somebody hey sometimes there ain't gonna be nobody there to encourage you i thank god for the encouragers in my life you don't know how much you mean to me when i'm standing at the back door or you call me on the phone or you send me a text or you send me a facebook message or you send me an email or or, or the phone rings or you see me out and you give me some kind words you don't understand how that encourages me but let me tell you something sometimes those words of encouragement aren't there and you know what I got to find my encouragement in? The Lord, because he's the only one that's always there. Amen. He's the only one that's always there. And he's the only one that will always be there, right? He will always be there. In Deuteronomy 31, 6, he said this. I love this verse. You need to write it down, underline it, memorize it. Be strong and of good courage. Fear not, nor be afraid of them. For the Lord thy God, he it is that doth go with thee. He will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. God is with you. Amen. God will never leave you. God will never forsake you. If he is, if you've been born again, washed in his blood, he is there for you. And you have got to learn to find your encouragement and build on that foundation. Hey, if I've got more encouragers, that's awesome. That's great. If I've got friends that are lifting me up, that's wonderful. If you've got a family that encourages you and a wife that helps you and a husband that helps you, that is awesome. But Hey, you have got to encourage yourself when there's nobody else around. That's what David had to do. Everybody was against him. Sometimes in life, everybody's going to be against you. You got to pick yourself up by the bootstrap. You got to do the right thing. You got to remind yourself of the, of the, of the right things. And I'm going to talk about that in a second. See, when you're discouraged, the devil gets in your head. Did you know it? The devil gets in your head and he tells you, hey, it ain't worth it. Throw in the towel. It's over. He tells you lies. Did you know that, ladies and gentlemen? You know the devil is a liar. The devil is a liar and the devil wants to keep you from what God has for you. And some of you are discouraged today and I want you to understand something. Hey, it's not over. Amen. If you're still a... Hey, you're not in the grave, are you? Raise your hand if you're dead here this morning. All right, raise your hand if you're alive. Say amen if you're alive. Amen. Say hallelujah if you're alive today. All right, put two hands in the air. Oh, we're going Pentecostal here, okay? Hey, hey, put your, hey, you know what? You're alive. There's hope today. You know what? I don't know what yesterday was and I don't care. You know why? Because I can't go back to your yesterday and change a thing. Neither can you, but we can change today. We can change tomorrow. Amen. And it's time that you encourage yourself. Hey, bad things may have happened in your life. You got to pick yourself up and say, you know what? God has a plan from here on. Can't change yesterday, but whoo, I'm going forward today. Amen. Encourage yourself in the Lord. God's never left you. He's never forsaken you and he never will. Amen. He never will. Hey, you got hope. You got hope today. There's hope for you. There's hope for you. If you, if you stumble in here, and man, you, get, you made bad choices, and you got some bad things going on in your life, and you just feel like a failure this morning, you know what I want to... I want to tell you to do. I want to tell you that you have hope today. You come to Jesus. Let him clean you up. If you've got stuff bad in your life, you, if you've made some bad choices, there's nothing like a bath that the Lord can give you. Let him clean you up. Set you on the right path. But don't you ever give up hope because as long as God is on his throne, there's always hope. Amen. 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 You say, Brandon, you don't know where I've been. 
You don't know what I've done. You don't know where I've been. And you don't know what I've done. Hey, we're all in the same boat. And I know how it is. The devil tells you, well, you're the only one to ever mess up this bad. You, you're just a failure. All those other church people, they're perfect. Didn't you know that? Look at that family over there. They've got it figured out. Look at that husband and that wife. I bet they don't argue like y'all. And that's what we do. We look around and we're like, I bet they're not as bad as I am. And you know what? I'm the pastor. I know all of them. And yes, they are. Okay? <laughs> they fight like cats and dogs, man. You don't understand. All right? They are screwed up. Okay? I promise you. You know, I, I, I love it. It's refreshing. Hey, I am a mess. You're a mess. But guess what? As long as God is on the throne, there's hope for us. Amen? There's hope for us. There's hope for us. If you ain't read your Bible in a week, Dust it off. Start again. Forget yesterday. Who cares? Get up and go on. Encourage yourself in the Lord. That's what David did. He found encouragement. You know what you can find encouragement? I wrote a couple things down here. I can find encouragement in God's faithfulness. Did you know that? God's faithful. Did you know that? God's faithful. God is faithful. He is. He's so faithful. He's there. Do you know, no matter where you go in life, whether you stay on the straight and narrow or you, you veer off, every time that your heart wants to go home and you call out his name, guess who's there? The Lord. You know why? Because he loves you and he's faithful. He's never going to go away. People let you down. God's faithful, isn't he? God is faithful. He's faithful. You know what he's faithful in? He's faithful, he's faithful in his grace. His grace. His grace. He gives me what I don't deserve. That's what grace is. He's faithful in it. It's always grace. As the songwriter said, if grace were an ocean, we're all sinking. God's grace is always there. You know what else is there? His mercy. His mercy. Mercy is you don't get what you do deserve. You know what I deserve? I deserve hell. I deserve to die. I deserve to live this life without God. And I deserve to die. And I deserve to go and be separated from God forever in the lake of fire. Because that's what I earn. Because I am a sinner. That's what I deserve. But Jesus looked down. He saw me in the future. He loved me before the foundation of the earth. And he said, I'm going to go down there and I'm going to give my life for Brandon. So Brandon doesn't have to be separated from me forever. And he gave his life and he gave me what I don't deserve. And I have eternal life this morning. I have eternal life and I will never die. And I will never be separated from God. And when, when this life ends, whether it be in, in, in natural death or I get sick one day and die. Or I die right now and drop dead. Hey. I have hope and I know that I will spend my eternity with God. Hey, when you realize that whatever happens today cannot change your eternity, you know what you do? You get encouraged in the Lord. You know, you know why you're discouraged all the time? Because you're not reminding yourself of how good God is. You're, you're always reminding yourself and your brain and your mind and your heart of how bad things are. You're listening to... To put it bluntly, to too much negativity and not enough positivity. Amen? Amen. You know what one of the most spiritual things you, some of y'all could do? Turn off the flipping news. Right? Somebody getting killed. Somebody getting abused. Somebody got uh, this. Somebody got that. Some, uh, this person robbed this person. This person. And then you turn it on. And you turn it on. What's going on in Washington? They're fighting. Oh, we can't do this. Oh, are we going to fix immigration? Are we going to do this? Are we going to do that? Oh, are we going to... Who's going to win the presidency? Who's going to run? Who's going to... Oh, and it's sniping and bickering and fussing and fighting. Nobody can get along. Some, one, you know what? Keep up with the headlines. Okay? But you don't need to be sitting there. You don't need to be sitting there 24 hours a day just keeping up with all the negative news. Because that's all they cover. They don't cover the positive stuff. Right? There's plenty of positive going on in this world. Do you know that? Amen? There's a, there's a lot of positive going on. But you don't hear about it. You know why? Because it doesn't sell. Right? It doesn't sell. Everybody wants to, oh, what did they do? Oh, you know. And, and a lot of the stuff they report on is not news anyway. Amen. This celebrity did this. Who cares? Okay? 
At the end of the day, we, we, you know, news is, well, you know, who won this ball game or that? I love sports just like everybody else, but that ain't news, okay? When they start dropping bombs, that's news. Tell me about it, okay? All right? Or we're going to go to war. But hey, we're, we're listening to that stuff all the time and we're, we're negative. And we can't lift ourselves up. We can't look and, and say, God, look at that sunrise. Look at that, that, that sunset. Look at the beauty of, of, of your creation. Man, I'm encouraged in you. Because you're, you're, you're focused on the negative. You got to clear your head of that negative. You got to focus on some positive. Some of us, we got the news on too much. Some of you, you just hang around the wrong crowd. You hang around the gossips. And you hang around the people that just negative. You ever been around somebody that just negative all the time? Nobody can please them. You people that go and order at the restaurant and always something's wrong with it. Shut up. Okay, like, you know, it's supposed to be pink and it's only like, it's almost pink. It's somewhere between this color. And I'm like, come, like, come on. Okay, come on. All right, we, we, we bicker and we fuss and, and, and we're negative all the time. You know what I think Christians ought to be in? And I know I'm weird. I think we ought to be happy. I know too many stinking grouchy Christians. It's like. It's like, I'm a Christian, you know? And they got this look on their face, and it's like, you, you know, and, and nobody wants to go to your church. Nobody wants to, I mean, why? Look at you, okay? I mean, nobody wants to go. Why? Because you are negative. You are a graft. All you, you, you know, or, or, it's, or you know, we'll gossip about people and talk about people. And, and, and Christians, church people, we do it in the form of a prayer request. You pray for this person because this happened and that happened. You know, we, we kind of like, look, come on. Don't let your, your mind be dominated by negative. Some of you, seriously, you ought to think about some of your friends because some of the people that you hang around with and you spend all your time are negative all the time. Maybe you can fix that. Maybe you can fix it by introducing positivity into it. Maybe, you, may, you know, every time a negative said, a po- you, you counter with a positive. Maybe you can do that. You've got to learn to encourage yourself in the Lord. You know what else I'm thankful for? God is long-suffering. He's long-suffering. You ever pray this prayer, Lord, I will never do that again if you'll just, yeah, yeah. anybody? Come on, come on. I promise, Lord, I will never. Ten minutes later, you did it again, right? Lord, if you forgive me, if you, I will never say that word again. And then the next time you, something goes wrong. Beep, 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 beep. Sound like Morse code. Sound like a telegraph coming in. Telegram. You say, Brandon, you got people in your church that use foul language? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) My wife. (laughs) Just at me. No, I'm just kidding. Not really. She knows. God is long-suffering. How many chances has he given you in your life? My goodness. I'd be scared to put a number on it. It's way more than a thousand. It's not second chances. It's not third chances. For me, it's like a million. (laughs) At least tens of thousands. But God's always there, isn't he? Doesn't mean there's not consequences to some of our actions. There There is sometimes. Sometimes we get what we deserve. Sometimes we don't. It's the mercy of God. But he's long-suffering. He's there. His love never ends, does it? See, when you start thinking about how good God is to you, and you start thinking about his mercy and his grace and how long-suffering he is, and you think about, you think about over the last 10 years of your life how many times you screwed up, messed up, how many times that you've been at the bottom and how many times God brought you through and how many times God cleaned you up and set you back up on your feet. Then you start thinking about that. And, you, you know, it'd be awesome if some of you just got out a pen and a piece of paper. Y'all still remember what those are? And took a pen and a piece of paper and wrote down some praises that God's done in your life. See, every Wednesday night we pray here and we take praise requests and all that kind of stuff. And you've prayed for things throughout the years of your life and God has answered those prayers. 
And you know what? God answers prayers for me every day of my life. He answers prayers. And you know what? You need to remember those things because as we go through life, we forget. We forget what God answered two years ago. We forget that time that we were scared to death for our health. And, and it, it, was, it was all right. We forget when God protected our child. And those are just the things that we remember and we know about. We don't even know how many times God protects us and we don't know it. God is faithful. He's long-suffering. He's lo- he loves you. You know what you need to do? You need to dwell on those things. You know what God says in Psalm 100? One of the awesome chapters of the Bible, Psalm 100. It's just a little short chapter, and it says that you are to enter into his courts with thanksgiving. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, enter into his courts with praise. You know how you're supposed to approach God? You're supposed to come to him. When, like when you start praying, you start doing de- your devotions, you should start it with praise. You got a lot on your heart, and you need a lot from God, and you got a lot of requests. I need this, and I need this, and I need this, and I need it now. That's how we live, if you're like me. That's why sometimes we got to push away, and we got to stop, and we got to come to Him with thanksgiving and praise and say, Lord, before I get to all the requests, I just want to tell you how awesome you are. I want to thank you for your mercy. God, you remember two, three years ago when I was in this mess, and I was here, and I was there. You remember 10 years ago. You remember 15 years ago. I was here, and you saw me through it, and you never gave up on me, and you loved me. And I just want you to know that I hadn't forgot it, and I love you. And I thank you, Lord, that I can get up on my feet and walk around today. I can look at my family, and I can see that they're healthy, and they're safe. We're going to have food to eat today. We're, 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 we're okay. we got a, a, a roof over our head. And you start going down, and you start thanking God for the things that he's done for you, and your negative attitude, and a lot. A lot of times, even the prayer request you were going to pray will change because your attitude changes. And I believe that's what the Bible says when it says God will give you the desires of your heart. When you approach him in the right way, he gives you the very desires to have and then he grants those desires. There's a right way to approach God. God's faithfulness. You know what else you can find encouragement in church? God's word. Amen. God's word. Where would we be without this book? Where would we be? David encouraged himself in the Lord. David picked himself up. Hey, you know what you got to do? You got to learn to be a preacher. You got to learn to find little nuggets in scripture. And that's all I do. I found a little verse this morning that said David encouraged himself in the Lord. And I build a sermon around it. You know what you got to find? You got to find those verses that jump out to you. You got to find those truth verses. And you got to memorize them. And you got to cling to them. And when, when negativity and discouragement come in, you go in there to the bathroom, look in the mirror, look at that woman, look at that man and you preach them a sermon and say hey you've got a lot to be thankful for pick yourself up don't you be discouraged God's still your God God's still on the throne the Bible's still the same you're still saved you are eternally God's and God is never going to leave you or forsake you and you preach yourself a sermon amen and you lift yourself up encourage yourself in the Lord Matthew 4 4 says man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God I quote this verse all the time because it says, basically, it equates the Bible to being your food. And if you do not have a steady stream of food coming in spiritually, and that's the Bible. If you're not reading your Bible, and I'm talking every day, truth of the matter, truth be told, we need the Bible a lot every day. We need it multiple times a day, not once a day. We need it a lot. But get in the habit of just going to it. Get it. Get in the habit instead of picking up your phone every five minutes, but replace some of those that phone time with bible time and put down that phone and pick up the bible and spend a little time and 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 you know what you don't have you don't have to read a chapter and come away with an, uh, an amazing thought that nobody's ever had before that's not what bible study is about it's you're feeding yourself you're feeding yourself everything on your plate everything i eat ain't my favorite food amen sometimes you get to go out to a nice restaurant and order that steak that you love but that's like for special occasions. Sometimes you're going to read the Bible and you are going to be blown away and you're going to be like, I, oh my goodness. But then the routine is going to be, I got in the Bible this morning and you know what? I've heard that before, but I was reminded of some things. And you just take that and you bolster yourself up and it's block after block after block after block. And pretty soon you got a wall. Pretty soon you're a strong Christian. You got a lot of faith. Hey, when the tough times come, when the bad times come, if you want to have faith to sustain you, you got to build up the faith. Amen. That faith is built block after block after block. You know what else? 
I'm encouraged by this morning? I'm encouraged that I'm secure in Christ. I am secure in Christ. One of my favorite passages on that subject is John 10, verse 28. It says it like this. It says, And I give unto them eternal life. Jesus talking. He gave me eternal life and they shall never perish. That means I'll never die. Amen. If God gave you eternal life, it doesn't have an expiration date on it, does it? Okay. When God says, hey, I eternally saved you. He gave you eternal salvation. Would you agree with that? Okay. That means it never goes away. Never goes away. And I know what a lot of people say. But what if? But what if, and you got a but question, right? And it's like, but what if I do this? What if I do that? God gave you a gift. You didn't do anything to get it. You can't do anything to lose it. Amen. He gave you eternal life. You say, Brandon. You say, Brandon, then I can go out and do whatever I want and just say, oh, God forgave me of it. But you're discounting something. You're discounting what happened when you received that gift. You were changed from the inside. And when you go out and do things, God is going to convict your heart. He's going to say, hey, you shouldn't be acting like that. You're my child. And he's going to fix you on the inside. Hey, you were eternally changed. Amen. You were born again. You're not the same person. Amen. But you're eternally secure in that salvation. I, I'm thankful for that. Because let me tell you something. If you could lose it, I would have lost it. Right? Why are you judging me then? Why would you say I would? No, I'm just kidding. You, you would lose it. If you could screw it up, you, you would. You'd find a way. But he gave unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. You know what Jesus is saying? You are in my hand and you're secure in my hand. You know, what God, you know what Jesus is saying there? If they want you, they got to come through me. When you're protected by Jesus, that's pretty good protection. Amen? Some of you need to tell yourself you're saved. You need to remind yourself because you're, you're down and out on yourself. And you're living in the past and living in regret and living on where you've been and what you've done and who you've done it with and all this kind of stuff. Hey, you are saved. You are forgiven. Jesus has you in his hand. And nobody, not even you, can pull yourself out of his hand. You're in his hand. Look at the next verse. It says this. Nobody can pull it, come out of my hand. My father, which gave them, that's you, me, is greater than all. And nobody, no man is able to pluck them out of my father's hand. So you're in Jesus' hand and you're in the Father's hand. Double layer of security. Amen. You're so stinking saved it's pitiful. Okay. You are. You're saved. Stop doubting it. I went through periods of doubt in my life. I don't know if I'm saved. I don't feel saved. I don't. Oh. I did something bad. I think God erased my name out of the Lamb's book of life. I'm not saved anymore. You know what that does? That feeds right into the devil's playbook. That's right where he wants you. You know why? Because I don't know if I'm saved. I'm saved. I don't know if I'm saved. I am saved. Back and forth. And you are ineffective for the work of God. You're not reaching anybody when you're sitting there back and forth. Living, sitting on the fence. Back and forth. Not cold, not hot. Just back and forth. You're ineffective. Look at the devil and say, you know what? God said I'm saved. You know what I am? I'm a feelings guy. I like to feel spiritual. I like it when the word of God just makes chill bumps come up. I love that. But you know what I had to decide a long time ago? Chill bumps or no chill bumps. God said it. I believe it. I don't care how I feel. Sometimes you got to talk to yourself like that. Because your heart will be like, oh, well, you're not. You don't feel this. You don't feel that. Tell yourself, you know what? God said it. I trust God's word more than my heart and my feelings. Encourage yourself in the Lord. You've got to learn how to preach. Amen? You're secure in Christ. How, you say, Brandon, how do I do that? Last things. Fall in love with his word. I just talked about it. Fall in love with his word. Every person in this room today, if you have not yet done it, get up. Get your Bible. Read before you go to bed tonight. Get alone with God and read a chapter. Read the Bible. Tell God, say, God, I've got to have this book in my heart. And I'm not going to sit here and read it all straight at once, but I'm going to commit to have a regular daily dose or doses of the word of God. I have got to have it. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. I've got to develop a hunger and a thirst. 
for God. The Bible says if you, uh, in Psalms, it says, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Some of you used to read your Bible all the time. Some of you, a year or two ago, you sat here at Catalyst Church and Brandon's always hammering it. Read your Bible, read your Bible, read your Bible. Every day, I don't care if you're sick, I don't care if you feel like it, I don't care if you get anything out of it. You got to read the Bible because you got to feed yourself. And you used to do it, but you've stopped. You hadn't read the Bible in six months. Oh, you get a little verse that pops up on your phone. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about getting down and saying, Lord... I need to hear from you. I'm going to read the Bible and I'm going to open this up and I'm going to spend a little time. The wife's in there. The kids are in there. The phone's in there. I, don't, I want this to be your time. Teach me your word. And you pray over it and you read a chapter or two. You spend 15, 20 minutes. You start your day that way. Dad, that would change your Christianity if you'd start your day that way. That would change how you are. That would change how you treat people. That would change your attitude. Some of you in here, you're always negative And you're always uh, uh, bickering and fussing. You can't get along with nobody. I guarantee you, you're not reading the Bible. Read 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 the Bible every day of your life. You say, Brandon, every time I come to church, that's all you say is read the Bible. When you start doing it, I'll say something else. Amen? All right? Read the Bible. Fall in love with His Word. You know what you're going to find? When you dig into the Word of God, you just get a hunger for more of it. I love it. You know what I've done in recent years? I fell in love with genealogies in the Bible. How weird is that? You fell in love with studying about who begat who and this one begat this one and this one. There's so much truth in there. I've discovered that there's so many layers of truth in the Bible. It excites me. It's fun. Fall in love with the Bible. Fall in love with it. Number two, learn to pray. You know how you're going to encourage yourself in the Lord? Get alone with God and tell him how you're feeling. God, I'm feeling down and out and I need you to lift me up today. God, I'm feeling like I want to throw in the towel and I know I can't and I need you to give me something that I don't have. I need the intestinal fortitude. I need some strength today and I don't have it. I don't, I'm looking around and I don't know where I'm going to get it. God, you've got to come for me today. See, I'm talking about developing a real prayer life. Not this, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. That is the most morbid, stinking prayer I've ever heard in my life. We teach our kids to pray if I die before I wake. Who wants to send your kid that nighty night, sweetheart, if I die before I wake? Don't do that. My goodness. Don't teach them to recite prayers. Get along with God and, 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 and unpack. You know what prayer is? Prayer is not even asking and getting things from God. Prayer is talking to God. It's conversation. That's why the Bible says pray without ceasing. Because your life should be one conversation with God that never ends. I'm bad to mumble to myself. I pray, and I'm not talking to anybody. And Andrew will be like, who are you talking to? And I'm like, and, and it's embarrassing when she catches me at it. You know, I'm mumbling. But I'm talking to the Lord, but it's, I don't know. Develop a prayer life. Maybe you'll be weird and a mumbler like me. I don't know. But pray. Pray about everything. If something bothers you, talk to God about it. If you, hey, if you've got sinful desires in you, say, God, I got sinful desires in me and I know how to get rid of them. Talk to him. Tell him. He already knows it anyway. Right? I tell him jokes. He's already heard them. All right. <laughs> Learn to pray. Number three, and this is it. Train your brain to avoid discouragement. Train your brain. <laughs> this is hard. You got to train yourself that when the wrong thoughts come in, you say no to yourself and not let your mind dwell on it. That's tough. Did you know that? I've been in places in my life <clears throat> where if people followed you around, they'd think you're crazy because you are sitting there and you're literally having a conversation with yourself. Uh-uh, uh-uh, you ain't going there. Nope, 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 nope. I'm crazy. I have gone crazy. You ever been there? You ever been back and forth? And, and man, the negativity just comes in and that old devil is literally, it feels like it's sitting on your shoulder and he's saying, Oh, this or oh, that. And he's trying to discourage you. You know what you've got to do? You've got to be in the Bible, get enough encouragement ammo that you've got for everyone he's got. You've got one to throw back at him. And you have got to say, hey, when your mind gets off course, can I tell you something? One of the worst things that you can do, listen to me, is sit around and do nothing. I got some blocks you can lift over at the house. You come on over. And I'll put you, we'll unstack them and stack them again. I know we won't. <laughs> no, hey, don't, don't be idle. 
You teenagers, one of the worst things you can do. You know when you're going to get in trouble? When you ain't got nothing to do. You're going to get in trouble when you ain't got nothing to do. When you're with your girlfriend or your boyfriend, you ain't got nothing to do. <laughs> Watch out. Right? Because you will find something to do. Okay? And you, it will usually be the wrong thing. You don't need to be idle. Because when you're idle, your mind wanders. You, gotta, you know what? You got you to gotta tell your brain what to think. Tell your brain what to think. You know, the best thing you could do is just get so stinking busy that it takes your mind off of it. You might have to change the radio station. Because my goodness, if you're down and out, <clears throat> if you're down and out, and you're low, you don't need Willie's Roadhouse, okay? <laughs> you don't need country music in general, right? Why? Your dog died, you're, you know, this one left, this one happened, this, yeah, come on, okay? And you don't need uh, the, the, the uh, uh, you might have to change the radio station, that's what I'm saying. You might have to change what's going into your head. You might have to change it. You might have to get off Facebook. Amen. That'd be a re revival, right, for you. It's like, oh, I'm going to give up Facebook. You didn't know what it was 10 years ago. Now you can't live without it, right? Some of us need to get, hey, you got to learn to train your brain. When your mind starts going to the wrong places. Nope, nope, I'm not going there. No, no, I'm not going there. I'm going to replace it. Get your Bible and read. Get head on your knees and pray. Okay. Turn a different song on. Turn something on to remind you. Go talk to somebody. Go do something. Go help somebody. Go do something completely out of, out of, out of character. Go find a, a, a widow woman to do something for her. Okay. Uh, mow her grass or, or do. Hey, you go find something to distract you. And I promise you, if you resist the devil and resist the devil and resist the devil and say no, no, no. You say no long enough and he will leave you alone. Resist the devil, the Bible says, and he will flee from you. You know what most of us do? We say no for a time or two, and then we're like, oh, okay, right? We give in because he's persistent. You be persistent right back to him, and you don't let him pull your brain off. Your heart and your mind will lead you in bad places. The Bible says the heart of man is desperately wicked. Who can know it? That's the wrong thing to say to me. It's like, well, I think that I want to... Do this because my heart says do it. That's a wrong thing to say to me. Your heart will lie to you, okay? Right? I want to leave my husband and run off with this, uh, you know, whatever. Because uh, my heart, I think God wants me to be happy. <laughs> it's like, I, 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 my, I, you know, my heart says do it. I feel like it. Or I'm going to divorce my husband because I don't feel like I love him anymore. I don't care about your feelings, okay? Your feelings are not my, you got to do the right thing, right? Right thing, right thing, right thing. Y'all got it? All right, let's pray. Lord, we love you. We love you so much. Thank you for being so solid, so consistent. Lord, when we look at, and it makes sense here in this room, when we look at, we start listing things out, your mercy, your grace, your long-suffering, how good you've been to us, how many prayers you've answered, your word. We can have a conversation with you. You're always there. We start listing out the attributes that you have and you give to us. It makes sense and it kind of encourages us. And some folks in here this morning, they, they're probably encouraged this morning because of some of the stuff they've heard and they feel like right now they can put one foot in front of the other. But later on at three or four o'clock when they're by themselves and that they're, they're at their house or in the morning when they wake up and they're confronted by the weight of the load that they have to carry, it's, they have got to encourage themselves because Brandon's not going to be there. It's not church day. We're not all gathered here. I've got to learn to encourage myself. I've got to learn to preach myself a sermon. I've got to train my brain. I've got to get in the word. I've got to pray. I've got to listen to the, the right music. I've got to fill my mind with the right thoughts. Lord, help those who need this this morning. They need it right now in their life. Help them. Give them what they need this morning. Help them to make decisions that will change their life this morning. Help them to be consistent. Help them to lay one block at a time and be consistent at it. Be steady at it. And those that everything's going good today, help them to file this away. And when they're in the valley, help them to remember it and pull it out. And encourage themselves in the Lord. Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Let me ask you this.
If you're here today and you say, Brandon, I'm not sure if I died today, I'd go to heaven. I'm not sure I'm saved. I'm not sure that I have eternal life, that my sins have been forgiven. I don't know beyond a shadow of a doubt that I'm going to heaven. But I want to know that. And God's speaking to my heart. And I want to know that. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to single you out. I'm not going to make you say anything. But if that's you and you're not sure you're saved, I want you to raise your hand up. Because the good news is you can be saved. You can be saved. It's so simple. Just raise your hand up. Brandon, I'm not sure I'm saved. Raise your hand up so I can see it. I'm the only one looking around. I just want to pray for you. I will not embarrass you. Anybody like that? Anybody like that? If you're here today and you say, Brandon, I'm discouraged. I walked in here discouraged this morning, and I need this. I've got to learn to encourage myself, and I need to take these thoughts, and I need to build on this, and I need this in my life. Pray for me. I want you to raise your hand. I see hands all over. I see hands all over. God bless you. I see teenagers. I see grown men. I see women. I see folks all over. If you're here this morning, you say, Brandon, I've not been in my Bible. It's no wonder I ain't got much faith. I hadn't been in it. I got to pick it back up. I got to pick it back up. And I'm deciding right now I'm going to pick it back up. I want you to raise your hand. I'm picking my Bible back up. I'm picking my Bible back up. I see those hands. God bless you. I'm picking it up. I'm picking it up. You got to be honest with yourself. If your walk with God's not where it's supposed to be, then you got to change it. If you're here today and you say, Brandon, I've not been praying. I used to. But I've just kind of turned a cold shoulder to God. I hadn't tuned him in to everything going on in my life. And it feels like I can't carry the weight, but I'm trying to carry it all by myself. And I hadn't been talking to him about it. But I'm going to start praying. I want you to raise your hand. I'm going to start praying. Anybody? God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. I want everybody to stand to your feet right now.